And the reason is because the melanin functions the same way. Now, many of our ancestors, our immediate ancestors, grandparents, great-grandparents, have talked about the visions that they've had, the voices that they've had, and even our little children are all the time talking to beings and entities. Now, they are actually hearing at a distance and also hearing in different dimensions. Now, these, were, these things were all known to us, but for whatever reason, and that, we won't go into that this time because we're going to stay strictly on melanin, we have begun to ignore and to educate this awareness out of ourselves, which causes us to have specific and severe problems in being able to communicate. This is a tremendous gift that allows us to be able to be aware of all things in all areas that we might be in and our knowledge of ourselves and what it is that we might be perceiving is very, very important for us to be able to be aware of. Let me talk about some things in here that I think are very basic before we go on for us to understand. Now, when I decided that uh, I needed to write down on paper a lot of the information that I had uh, discovered, I chose something that most of us had been exposed to, minerals and vitamins, to begin to give this information as to how something so simple as a mineral and vitamin might be different in concentration or type based upon the amount of melanin that you have. Well, when I began to look at the biochemistry of melanin, it was very interesting to recognize that many of the vitamins and minerals that are prescribed are part of the melanin molecule already. Vitamin D is part of the melanin molecule. All you have to do is go outside for 20 minutes and stand in the sun and your body makes vitamin D for you. It's something that you never have to take. So it made sense to me then that those individuals who live in the north where there was very little sun, okay, let me just, excuse me, give you some further information on vitamin D. We need vitamin D to be able to absorb and utilize calcium. So if you lived in the north where there is very little sun and you stayed there long enough, eventually you wound up being very pale and having what appears to be no melanin. So obviously you need calcium for your bone structure, your hair and nails. How are you going to get it? Well, you can't make it from the melanin because you don't have it. So therefore, a big research project took effect to find out what outside of ourselves could be identified to make melanin since we no longer could make it from within. And it was discovered that cod liver oil was very high in vitamin D. So if we caught these fish and took the fat off of them and stored it, it took a little bit every day, then we'd be able to hold on to our calcium and absorb that that was in our food. So now when you recognize that and you realize that now you're standing there in the store next to somebody who's jet black and they come over and they ask you what type of vitamin D or cod liver oil would be good for them, what do you do? Because you know that this individual does not need cod liver oil, and as a matter of fact, them taking cod liver oil starts to actually produce crystallization and hardening in their soft tissues. So they start getting all these little lumps and knots and things under the skin and in the muscle because they have too much vitamin D and they're absorbing and holding on to too much calcium that can't be deposited in the bone, so then the body has to take it and deposit it somewhere else, but calcium is not supposed to be there. We found out that riboflavin, for example, and uh, yeah, pyridoxin are normal parts of the melanin molecule, where pyridoxin and riboflavin are very important to prevent certain skin diseases uh, and to propel certain reactions to occur in the body. As long as you have melanin, you don't ever need to take these particular vitamins. Now it's very interesting because when I did the research, I noticed that many health books, many health practitioners are talking about niacin. That if you have poor circulation, that you should take niacin because niacin opens up your circulation so that the tissues can get oxygen. 
But when I did the research on niacin, I found out that niacin is a byproduct of the toxic drug known as nicotine. And that it was not a vitamin at all. It is actually an addictive drug known as nicotine. It's a byproduct of that. But this particular byproduct of nicotine has the capacity to cause the superficial blood vessels to dilate. So I was like, oh, that's real interesting. Well, let's find out more about that. Well, I found out that individuals who have very clumpy melanin, which appears as though they don't have any, okay, what we call melanin recessive individuals, also do not have a complete, well-developed superficial circulation. So it's very interesting because as I talked about earlier, the fact that the more melanin you have, you also have a nerve ending connected to the melanin granule, which means you have two brains, one outside and one inside your head. Now, for all those melanin granules you have, especially the darker you are, you've got to get oxygen to them. So the body knows that and makes sure that you have a circulatory system that will carry the blood to the melanin granule so that it will stay alive to relay information to the nerve that it's attached to so that it gets back to your brain so you can make a decision about what it is that you found out is going on in your environment. So therefore, the melanin dominant individual has two circulatory systems, a deep circulatory system and a superficial circulatory system, just like they have an internal and external brain. Individuals who are melanin recessive only have a deep circulatory system and they do not have a well-developed superficial circulatory system. So therefore, because they knew that about themselves, they had to have a means of being able to drive the blood to the skin. So when they found out about niacin that causes the superficial blood vessels to dilate, this was an excellent idea to take this so that the superficial blood vessels could get bigger so that more blood could get to the skin. And to then make it something essential in your diet, that is to make it a vitamin, would mean that you would always ensure, if you taught your children this, that this was something that they would make sure that they would want to have. Now I'm like, oh, that's very interesting. So this isn't even a vitamin, and it's not even something that we're supposed to take. Because now when we look at the effect of what nicotine does to the melanin molecule, it's horrendous. Nicotine actually just about deactivates the melanin molecule. It actually causes a sludging effect and it actually diminishes its capacity to actually even pick up frequencies of light to relay the information to the brain. So it's very, very interesting because unlike Caucasians that smoke heavily, when we look at the whites of the eye, when we look at the color or luster of the skin of melanin dominant individuals that take in nicotine, it totally shuts their lights out. That is to say that you can walk up the street and see a black person who smokes because they look like someone has blown soot on their face. They have no luster at all, there's no light, there's no sheen at all on their face. In Caucasians who smoke. The way that you can tell they smoke is that you can look at their fingers where they hold the cigarette and see the actual nicotine deposit in the skin or see the discoloration on their teeth. But you can't look in their face and tell whether they're smokers or not because they don't have the melanin that actually circulates the light through the skin for you to see if it is actually now dysfunctional or not working because of the reaction of the nicotine. So it's not coincidental that the smoker also, who is melanin dominant, especially has problems with loss of sensory perception. That is, that they can get burned easy because now the melanin that would normally feel the heat, because it's not active, they don't feel that anymore. So they get numbness in their hands, tingling in their hands, tingling in their feet. They also begin to lose their sense of taste. And they have to start using much more salt, eating more spicier foods, etc., because the melanin molecule now, excuse me, the nicotine in the cigarette smoke is now actually diminishing the entire sensitivity of the nervous system. So I'm like, oh, now this is very, very interesting. So when they have this old adage, one man's medicine is another man's poison, 
very, very true in the case of nicotine and being melanin recessive or melanin dominant. Now, we went on to look at some other interesting things. We went on to find out, for example, that the melanin loves fat. It loves fat. And so anytime there's fat put in the body, it actually binds to the melanin molecule and is used very slowly. And in many circumstances, it's recycled. So therefore, melanin-dominant individuals do not have to have high-fat diets to maintain their body fat. Because when they eat that, it's actually bound to the melanin molecule and recycled. So therefore, there was a whole story in a study, some hospitals have been doing studies on African women to find out why it is that they're the most fattest women in the world. Now, obviously, I know the answer. It's because they have a substance in their body that loves fat already. And so therefore, if they eat diets that are extremely high in fat, animal fat especially, hamburgers, meat of any type that is high in fat, because their body will already store fat, and they put extra fat inside their body, and they don't release it because the melanin binds it on. That's why they're the fattest women in the world, because they eat inappropriately for their body, metabolism, physiology, and structure. Now I said, well, that's real interesting, because now why would we have this gift? I'm always into looking at everything as a gift, not a problem. So when you look at it as a gift, then that automatically then gives you insight as to how you can use it for your advantage, not to reject it. So I'm like, okay, now the Creator gave us this gift. We can eat just a little fat and we'll keep it for five years. Now what's the, what's the reason for that? Well then when I went back and looked at, well where do all these people live primarily that have this propensity to store fat? And they live in an area that is very hot and that most of the foods there have very little fat. So if you're living at the equator and it's 110 degrees every day, and you know anything about energies, sugar, fat, and protein, when it is broken down by the body, gives off energy. That's why we eat. Out of all the three building blocks of the body, the fat molecule gives off the highest concentration of energy. So that is to say that if it was 110 degrees outside, and if you killed an animal and sat down and ate it, you would overheat your body and would have a heat stroke. Not because it was too hot outside, but because you ate a substance that when your body breaks it down, gives off so much heat that from the heat from the outside and the heat that's generated from within, it would totally, totally short circuit your normal functioning capacity. Now, all you have to do is just try this out today. The last time I heard it was 92 degrees. So now you just go to Kentucky Fried Chicken or McDonald's or someplace and get you a hamburger. And just sit there and eat it. And see what happens to you in a half hour. Just sit right there on the bench and just eat it and see what happens to you in a half hour. You will become so miserable you cannot stand it. And so your natural reaction is going to be if you want something that has ice in it, something that's cold, or you got to get to the air conditioner fast. And this is very interesting because when I was a child, I was very concerned one year. I was to be about seven years old and that's all I heard was sirens going up and down the street and on the news they were cautioning everybody about it being too hot and having heart attacks. Now this was before it was popular for everybody to have air conditioning. And they were even giving out fans to the older people to cool them down. Because with the temperature being so hot this time of this particular summer, so many people were having heart attacks that the hospitals couldn't help them. And I said, what is happening? As a little kid, I said, what is happening that would cause, excuse me, that would cause so many people to have heart attacks? Well, when I began to do the study years, years later, I recognized that again, all these people forgot about the normal physiology okay, of the food constituents and they were all sitting there this hot summer eating this meat. But because there were no air conditionings and they didn't have any fans, it was overheating their body and they were actually having heart attacks and angina and were having, were having to go to the hospital. So now I recognize that we can tolerate an enormous amount of heat when we eat properly. 
and eat in alignment with our normal physiological structure. Now let me tell you about heat and the melanin molecule. Carol Barnes writes a lot about this. This is how he got interested in doing the research on melanin. <coughs> Okay, thank you. He um, was given an assignment to find out what he could do to insulate the wiring of a high projectile object so that it would not short circuit electrically while going through space. This was a project that this his company he worked for was being contracted by NASA to figure out. If you remember the Sputniks and all these other objects they were projecting in outer space, they all burn up before they could get out of the stratosphere. And the reason why is because the electrical wiring would set the object on fire. Because when it would go through space, the friction would overheat it and it would actually start a fire. So their thing is like, we got to have a means of communicating with this thing. It's got to have electrical wiring. But how can we get it through the stratosphere to outer space and it not burn up? So again, because they've been doing research on melanin since the 1700s, they knew that melanin had a wonderful capacity, that it could be exposed to high temperatures and actually drop the temperature by 50 to 60 percent, even though it was exposed to high temperatures and maintain its normal metabolic functioning. So they have found out that the melanin molecule can be exposed to up to 1,500 degrees of temperature and only lose 50% of its normal functioning. And that it also can drop the temperature after exposure by 50%. So therefore, Carol Barnes and his company made synthetic melanin, incorporated it into the rubber that enclosed these electrical wires, and that's how these objects are now being able to get out of space because they are all insulated in line with artificial melanin that covers the wiring system. So then that really says something about you then, because now here you are, it's only 92 degrees outside, and you have a substance within you that has the capacity to absorb heat and dissipate it so that you don't even get hot. Why would you be fanning, and why would being in 90 degree weather be a problem for you? Normally it wouldn't, if the melanin was functioning properly or if you hadn't put something in your body that caused the melanin to get overheat. So what we see is many people who have, who are African people who talk about they can't stand the sunshine, they can't stand the heat, they've come in contact with a substance that has bound itself to the melanin molecule where the melanin molecule is not functioning normally anymore. So the key here is not an inability to be able to deal with sunlight and to deal with high temperatures, but we are looking at a toxic reaction. So therefore that means that with as long as the air is circulating in here, our body will normally give off this heat through perspiration, we can be active, etc., and still be comfortable. Air conditioning is not something that is a natural need for us. And it's very interesting because when we expose ourselves to this, the first thing that we notice is an incapacity to move. And when I say that, it is that the first thing that people want to do is that they want to sit down. They don't want to do anything. And then they find out they can't get up after they sat down in that for so long. So it brings about rigidity, stiffness, the loss of mobility, etc., which is a dis-ease state. It brings about a dis-ease state. And when you think about it, it does the exact same thing that it would do to water. Water, when it's in its normal state, is fluid. It'll go in any direction that it is exposed to unless you contain it, which is how your body's supposed to be. As soon as you drop the temperature, what happens? It gets stiff, rigid, and fixed. And that's the same effect that any cold environment has on us. We are not supposed to be stiff, rigid, and fixed, nor are we to expose ourselves to cold environments because we do not have a circulatory system that supports our metabolism to do this because remember what I said, we have to have blood in two places at the same time. We have to have blood under the skin because of all this melanin to feed the second brain and blood deep within to supply the deep organs. Now, unlike the African, if you put the Caucasian in ice, they do fine. 
That's why they were able to ski and play hockey and all the other stuff that they do. Because now all their blood is deep in the body. So therefore, even though it might be cold on the outside, they don't feel that very much because they don't have a blood supply that is taking a lot of information to the skin anyway. But the major areas of the body, their flexible joints, their liver, etc., is staying warm because all the blood is pooled there in their only circulatory system. So when I began to look at environment and its effect on the structures of body and then why bodies were structured the way they were based on the functions they were to serve, then it got very clear to me as a physician that there were some serious problems in the healthcare system in relationship to honoring the uniqueness of an individual's body and what it was supposed to do. Now, how many of your physicians are telling you this? And how many of your physicians are able to basically tell you why there's certain food you should have, why certain vitamins you can't take, and most of all, why certain drugs are very dangerous for you because of these unique structures that you have? Now, you can go to your plant store or your botanical store, and they'll be able to give you this information for any particular plant, chrysanthemums, roses, petunias, etc. They can tell you what to give them, what not, the food, etc., that they should have. You can go to your pet shop, and they can tell you why French poodles have to have a certain type of food with certain type of protein in them and a certain type of fat concentration, whereas a German Shepherd has to have something totally different. But why not for humans? Now, I thought that was incredible, that we have ecology for pets, ecology for animals, and there's no ecologic system created right now that's practiced to make sure that each unique type of human being maintains and stays the best that it can be. So now, what do you do then if you are paying into and visiting a system that has not seen you or thought of a need to give you the best information for you so that you can be the best. Well, you can have, you have a lot of choices. The simplest, obvious two, is that you can then demand that the system give you that, or you can do the study on your own and give it to yourself. And so that's why I felt that it was extremely important to put this information down so that you could have it to make some decisions about how you want it to continue to treat yourself. Because what is being offered to us and available at this point in time is not honoring the unique attributes and principles that we have, which is why they just tell you right up front, you all don't seem to do well when you come here to get our medicine, et cetera. Okay, but now they never told you why that you didn't do well. But now you can have the answer. There's a tremendous amount of information to let you know why. I want to bring it to your um, attention about just a few more things. It was real interesting when we started looking at drugs, because I was very concerned about that. If I prescribe for you a phenothiazine drug, which is Haldol, Elevil, Prolixin, Thorazine, all of these different type drugs because of supposing you're having some problems being able to stay in the orientation of this space and time and this reality or if I prescribe for you a hypertensive drug, was I really giving you the proper concentration based upon your, new, your unique chemistry? And when I began to do the research on that, just these two particular families of drugs, I found out that I was doing you a disservice because it has been identified that giving African and melanin-dominant individuals Haldol, Prolixin, Thorazine, et cetera, the dosage has to be significantly low. Because of the amount of neurologic tissue that we have, this drug has a tendency to cause extreme impairment of the nervous system very rapidly. And that it had already been identified that the Caucasians needed a much higher concentration of these drugs to have the effect than the African. Now, for those patients that have come to see me that, for whatever reason, were diagnosed to have been schizophrenic or had an acute or mild depression, they were on the highest doses of this stuff. And when you looked in the PDR, it was actually the same dose that was recommended that was based for the Caucasian. Thank you. So I was quite concerned about the fact that 
many of the individuals that I was seeing that were taking this were having problems with memory loss. They were having problems with bladder control. They were having problems with uh, severe paranoia, even far beyond when they got on the medication. And I would ask them to ask their doctors, did they know anything about why they should have these kind of reactions? And every time, the patient would come back and say, the doctor doesn't want to cut the dose down. As a matter of fact, too many times it was increased. So I'm like, oh, this is very, very interesting. It was also noted that the antihypertensive drugs, because of the structure of our body, that when they gave us enough to decrease our blood pressure, everything else decreased. Our desire for sex, desire to eat, desire to think, <laughs> desire to move, and everything else. I'm like, oh, this is like really interesting. So the key here is what are we going to do? Because now it's very clear that there is a whole hospital system that we have been asked to become clients of that do not have the information to be able to treat us appropriately based on our basic chemistry and sensitivity. Are you gonna ask the doctor to go back to medical school to find out what is needed for you? And most of them, I don't think, would take that too well. So the key here is that there needs to then be an understanding that there are certain things that you can do for yourself to help you until the system catches up with understanding who they are treating. I was very surprised to find out that because of our structure, we mature almost 50% faster than the Caucasian race. That is to say that they have identified the fact that the African is an adult by age 14. That the African can actually begin to be toilet trained by six months of age. And so therefore, when the African child is held at home and not allowed to go to school until he or she is five years old, retardation has already ensued. When the African child is not asked to begin to become aware of their own neurologic function and memory function at six months old and they're asked to wait till two years old, retardation has already ensued. So now, then what are we to do? Because now we have to become aware of the fact that we are living in a system that is not serving us for us to be our best. We can ask the question if that is the system's responsibility or is it ours to give ourselves the best? In closing, it seems like time goes so fast, I just want to relate to you just a couple more things. That in this melanin research, it was noted that many of the opiate drugs, and actually they refer to parts of the melanin as the opio-melanotrophic molecule, that opium, heroin, tetrahydrocarbon, which comes from marijuana, crack, all have parent structures exactly like a large part of the melanin molecule. Now, I thought that was very interesting, that the basic core structure of these street drugs have the basic core structure of the melanin molecule. So it has always been noted that when a melanin recessive individual and a melanin dominant individual were detoxing from the use of these drugs, the melanin dominant individual had a tremendously much more difficult time in doing so. Well, now we know the reason. Because when this substance is put into the body, it is not just put into the body and excreted through the urine and through the lungs and liver. It actually binds to your melanin. And depending upon what you're eating and what you're not eating can bind to it for life. Fine. That means then that our detox programs have to have some different features in them for melanin dominant individuals to be able to detoxify from these substances. When you ask what is the program that our detoxification or drug rehab programs have to break these substances off the melanin molecule, what is their response to you? They look at you like you're crazy. They don't know what you're talking about. It has been identified that we secrete melanin on a 24-hour basis, and that based upon our activity, what we've eaten, the concentration can go up or down, and also based upon our health. If you happen to get a urine sample tested for a particular drug that I've named, because the melanin molecule and that drug have the same parent structure, 
you probably will test positive.